I think most people covet a certain type of tool. Whether it's drooling over a saw stop, or eyeing the new festival catalog. Whoa. Or maybe you have a picture of an Avid CNC on your shop wall. It might sound a little silly, but a lot of us hold these tools in a very high regard. And that's what the Glowforge was for me. I wanted to get my hands on one ever since I first saw it at Maker Fair, and even more so after falling victim to the ads that populate all of my YouTube feeds. In fact, here's another one right now. I even tried to avoid Glowforge's hooks by getting a K40 laser, which works great. I've used it to create a lot of cool projects and it still works really well. But ultimately it was my wife who wanted something a little bit more intuitive and turnkey that kind of turned the tide. So we reluctantly pried open our wallets and bought this $3,000 laser engraver. Now, I have to be honest, I was excited about getting my hands on the Glowforge. Glowforge! <laughs> Is daddy excited about it? Eh. <laughs> I was curious if it was as good as it was advertised and as good as what a lot of people have told me, um, even close friends. But after six months with the Glowforge, it has definitely lost its luster. I'm gonna talk about some of those items now. This video is partially a review, but it's also kind of a look back at my last six months with the machine and what I've noticed about it, both good and bad. And I think I'm gonna break it up into several parts. Here are the different main points I'm gonna cover. So first is build quality. Second point I'm gonna mention is maintenance. How much work does it take to maintain the machine? Next is software, the cut quality and final product you could get out of the machine compared to, at least in my experience with the K40. Covering some major issues that I have with the machine that I think that more people should know about before jumping in and taking the plunge into buying a Glowforge. Although some of these might be a similar issue with most lasers in this price range. And then some final thoughts. So let's start with build quality. The top of the Glowforge has a tempered glass construction that makes it really appealing and really nice and really sturdy. It's not going to break apart, it's not made from cheap pressed tin, and it is a pretty beefy build. The inside of the Glowforge also has those nicer finishing touches with a pull down front so you can easily remove the honeycomb tray and do some really good in-depth cleaning. All right, so the next item is maintenance because when you're cutting things, especially with the laser, it makes smoke, it makes soot. It has some sort of byproduct from that process, which means that the machine has to be cleaned. And there's no way of getting around that. And I think Glowforge does a pretty good job in making basic maintenance pretty easy. In fact, I'm gonna say this right now that if anybody has a Glowforge or is thinking of buying one and wants a good reference for how to clean it, then my friends at Wing Geeks Craft have a fantastic video on really how to do that process. In fact, I've watched it several times just to make sure that I'm doing a good job in maintaining my machine. So I'm gonna show you a couple simple things in terms of maintenance and how Glowforge has made it somewhat easy in order to do that. As a result of the build and how this is physically put together, I had already referenced one thing that makes it easy to clean, which is this front gate that pulls down and allows you to pull out the honeycomb tray, or sometimes called like a crumb tray because all the crumbs from everything is cut. We'll go down in there, you can clean that out, and you're good to go. And you have a couple of mirrors that are hidden in different parts of the back that also need to be cleaned and maintenance. The one other thing that I think that they did a really great job on, which is a pain to do in some of the other cheaper lasers, has to do with the mirror alignment, which you don't have to do here. As far as I know, unless the machine has really been jostled around, the alignment of the mirrors stays pretty solid. They're kind of locked in place, but they do have to be cleaned at times. And on the main print head, which is right here, they've also made the process really easy. And everything is somewhat modular, being able to take this off and clean it and clean the mirrors that are embedded in there. And then even the entire cartridge comes off in a fairly easy fashion to get to the other mirrors that are all around and to clean them appropriately and pretty easy to put it back in. I do regular maintenance on the machine about a week, just kind of like wiping and cleaning the mirrors and it's all been pretty easy so far. So that is another positive of the machine. And I want to make sure I give credit where credit is due. So maintenance, 
pretty easy. Oh, and then of course, don't want to forget about the camera because this has to be cleaned as well. The soot kind of rises up and that little guy has to get cleaned at times. Hello there. All right, so a small item I want to talk about really quickly for the machine is sound. It may not be a big deal for a lot of people. So like for me, I have my Glowforge in my garage. So this is half of a typical garage of storage and laundry and all those things. And I have one half that is pretty much a part of my makerspace, part of my shop. So sound out here isn't a big deal for me other than just a slight annoyance of something being loud. And there's two different sounds that you're gonna hear from the Glowforge, kind of. So let me show you the first. The one is just the startup, where you get to see it, hear a little bit more of the, the raw sound of the machine. In fact, I'll open the lid just to kind of see the startup process just a little bit. And here is the startup sound of the machine. So that sound you're hearing is the startup cycle of the machine. Doing a systems check and starting a internal fan, at least it sounds like an internal fan for whatever reason, if it's just trying to keep the internal temperature um, at a certain degrees, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but that is the startup sound. The working sound is a lot louder and sounds almost like a jet engine. And this is the sound of the machine when it's actually engraving or cutting. mainly because they're integrated fan. Once, which once again is both good and bad because you need a really strong fan in the system to pull out all the exhaust and make sure that there's no fires and the inside is staying relatively smoke free. But it is pretty loud. Now there is a way around this and it's not advised that you do this until after your warranty is up, but you can disable that internal fan and add a inline fan at the end of your duct hose in order to pull it out. And once again, my friends at Wing Geeks Craft have a video about adding in an external fan and the result, the positive result of doing that, especially if you're ever looking at using this inside your house, which under the right conditions, you can, but I don't necessarily want this in my house. The next point to talk about is software. The software for the Glowforge is a proprietary web app that gives you access to a storefront for materials and designs, community support, a design studio, if you pay the premium to access, and the ability to communicate with your laser to upload designs and to set the parameters for cutting on the machine. The interface is clean and fairly straightforward, but there are key features that are locked behind a paywall. The cost between $20 and $50, depending on your subscription plan, if you choose to pay for those features. I know that may not seem like a big deal to some people, but to me, it feels a little bit disrespectful to Glowforge owners who chose to buy this particular laser when there are other options. And there are really simple features that are locked behind the paywall, such as flipping a design or rotating it in a certain manner. Really basic functions that shouldn't cost any extra. As far as cut quality goes, it's pretty much what you'd expect from a machine like this. It engraves, it cuts, and it uh, etches. And most of the time, I can get pretty good results. But there's also quite a few times when I get some unexpected results. Whether it's overburning, which I know can be a result of the feed rate and the power of the laser on the material. But the more frustrating part is when I cannot get it to cut all the way through a piece of material. Once again, I know that there are some user issues with that where you have, once again, feed rate, the power of the laser, and different variations in the material that you're trying to cut through. But in my case, I'm only cutting through eighth inch material, either eighth inch draft board or eighth inch uh, birch plywood. And that should not have any issues whatsoever. But on several occasions, when I'm working on a client's order, I would have issues and it's been really frustrating. So now I wanna talk about what I would consider to be some major issues with the Glowforge. Not just with the machine, but the ecosystem. The first major issue is the internet connection requirement of the Glowforge. Now, I already knew some of this going in, but there is a portion of this that I was not clear on. What I didn't know is that the Glowforge servers act as a type of big brother when using your machine. It looks at and monitors pretty much all activity that happens on the Glowforge. Every design you upload gets filtered through the Glowforge servers 
and probably even get stored there to a degree. Now, if that doesn't matter to you, it's probably not that big of a deal, but privacy kind of matters to me, and it, I'm kind of weirded out by that process. From Glowforge's point of view, it's a quality control and customer service feature. They can help you with your machine remotely, they can look at the activity and try to help you troubleshoot problems you might be having, which I think is great. But I think the key word here is control. This practice unnecessarily places an extra step between you creating and physically producing your creative vision. So much so that the mere act of trying to get a design loaded and ready to cut on the Glowforge can kind of be time consuming because it has to get uploaded to their servers. It gets processed and then sent back down to the machine to be cut. Now, you can speed this up, of course, if you pay for the premium subscription. You get fast lane access on their servers to get your images processed first. I think it's kind of a sketchy business practice, but it's something that they're trying to do as an incentive to sell their premium memberships or subscriptions. The next major issue I want to cover is cooling. Now, this may not apply to everyone, but this does apply to a pretty large number of people, some that I know personally and have talked about this problem with. The Glowforge has some cooling built in. It has a small reservoir with a water pump that will cycle the fluid through the laser tube in order to keep it cool while it is actually in operation. The problem is that the reservoir to keep the laser cool is extremely small. In fact, here's how small it is. For a laser of this power to stay cool, in a relatively warm environment is nearly impossible. In fact, it's the summer right now and I've barely been able to use my Glowforge. I can use it in the morning, usually starting about seven to maybe about 10 a.m. and then it gets too hot. Then I almost can't use it till after eight o'clock at night. Now, I know there's a couple things at play here. So one is the environment that I have it in. I have it in the garage, my garage is warm. But the ambient temperature in my garage is probably about 80 degrees. 80 to 85 degrees. And that is too warm for the Glowforge a lot of times. That's really frustrating. And there's not a whole lot of other options for me to get around that other than moving it inside my house. And I already talked about why I don't want it inside my house, primarily because of potential smoke, even though it goes outside the window. I don't have a proper filter for it. And it's loud. It is a workshop type machine. And I have it in an area that I deem part of my workshop. And right now, during a big part of the summer, it's a $3,000 paperweight. That is a huge problem. I don't have that same problem with my $350 K40 laser because I have a water pump and a five gallon bucket of water that keeps the laser tube cool and cycled. This is not acceptable. I also don't know what I would do to fix it. I hope the Glowforge addresses this at some point even if it is an aftermarket solution, I would have to consider it at this point. The last two things I want to bring up in this section of the video are not necessarily major issues, they're minor. And there's some things that maybe a new laser owner may not have thought about before they chose to buy the machine. The first is that there is a definite height limit for the machine in terms of the material that you can put inside. This is well known if you look at the literature for Glowforge, it is not a surprise. It is a physical limitation of the machine. So for this, it's a little bit more of just be aware that there is that physical limitation. You cannot move the print head up and down. You can take out the honeycomb tray or the crumb tray that I think they typically refer to it. But the times I've tried doing that, the Glowforge acts kind of funny about us. So there might be an extra calibration step I might be missing, but it's definitely something that makes it awkward and limits what you can put in the machine to engrave. The final item that I'm going to mention, I already mentioned before in going over the maintenance and the build quality of the machine. And that has to do with the camera. Hello there. The camera is a great selling feature. The fact that you can see your workpiece in there before you start the print job. The problem is that the camera is really not that effective and not that helpful at times. You don't get to see a live view of your piece being cut or engraved. And the camera is really just there for an approximation of placement. It is not very accurate at all. And my wife and I have ruined a lot of different cuts 
because the camera was not accurate and the camera did not line up correctly. Now, I mentioned before that there is a calibration process for the camera that helped a little bit, but it is still not accurate enough. Everybody's preference and what their margin of error is is a little bit different, but my cuts have been off a 16th to an eighth of an inch at times, and that's, that's unacceptable when you're trying to place something on a workpiece. Luckily enough, the material was not a really expensive piece of wood, so it wasn't that big of a deal, but if I was using a higher end piece of wood or one of Glowforge's higher end proof grade materials, I would have been pretty upset. There is an easy way to fix this. And that is, let us test fire. In a lot of other lasers, you could do a test fire to know exactly where that starting point is for the project. And it's also a little bit of peace of mind knowing that that is where the project's gonna start and that's where it's gonna be placed on your board. The camera is supposed to be able to replace that need, but it hasn't. And that is something that Glowforge could fix. I, I really, really wish they would. All right, so to finally wrap this up, I know it's been a long video, and if you made it this far in the video, thank you, I really appreciate it. Final thoughts on the machine. The Glowforge is a really good machine. It is built really well. It has almost all the features that I would want in a machine. The software, makes it almost unbearable. The small cooling makes it almost unusable for me. So I don't know if I would ever buy the Glowforge again, at least not without looking a little bit closer at all the other options. Unfortunately, it's really hard to get a hold of one of the other ones to test drive and do a proper comparison. So it was ultimately Glowforge's marketing that won in my household. And now I'm just gonna have to find workarounds and different ways to deal with the issues that I have with the machine. If you have a Glowforge and you like it or love it, that is great, I am so happy for you. I wish I could say the same thing. I really wanna like the machine. But on a positive note, there are quite a few things that can be fixed simply in the software. And Glowforge does have the ability to make those changes and make for a better customer experience. And I really hope they do, because I would love to make a secondary video and another follow-up video saying how much I love the machine. I would really love to turn this around. But as of right now, those are my feelings on Glowforge. Once again, if you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. All of your views mean so much to me and the channel, and I appreciate every single one of them. If you'd like to help out the channel and our position to do so, we have a Patreon. And you can find that at patreon.com slash geekbuilders. We also have a shop that sells shirts like this one. Lasers are cool because lasers are cool. Which is another way you can support the channel. Or just keep watching. We have a lot of videos in the back catalog. And there's quite a few that I think that you'll end up liking if you haven't seen them already. So that wraps up this episode. Please enjoy while you design, make, and play. See you in the next video.